Good morning, and welcome to our first presentation of this, the 29th annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. 29 years is a long time. It's an eternity in this business, and that's how long we've been here discussing technologies, uh, their expansion, their marketability, uh, and the business models they imply. It really is difficult to get a handle on all of these issues. Sometimes you have to address a, spe a specific angle in the market to figure out what is actually going on, let's say in the field of mobility, but not only. I'll be talking to uh, uh, Jacob Martin, who is the Hydrogen Business Development Manager at Haskell, and we'll be talking about hydrogen refueling systems, an absolute necessity in order to get mobility mobile. So please welcome with me Jacob Martin. Morning, Brian. How are you doing? You all right? Uh, how are you? So much. I'm going to pull that forward so we can get in. Yeah. Oh, a bit of sorry. a giant. My apologies. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay. So first questions first, of course. Tell us a bit about Haskell, where you're located, and what you people do. Yeah. So Haskell's been going uh, for just short of 76 years now. Um, history in hydrogen compression, not just hydrogen. So natural gas, lots of other different molecules. We treat ourselves as molecule agnostic. So we're wholly owned by Ingersoll Rand, uh, the US-based uh, conglomerate, um, and we're heavily focusing our, uh, our sort of strategy on hydrogen refueling stations. So you, you said, and I love this expression, uh, molecule agnostic. When did your expertise in gases in general and hydrogen in particular, uh, shift towards the emerging large market of hydrogen and fuel cells? Yeah, so hydrogen's been part of our industry for, for many, many years. So actually being able to refuel vehicles isn't a new thing. You know, years and years ago, um, NASA sent rockets to the moon using liquefied hydrogen. So this is not a, not a new molecule, but it's a new molecule for refueling. So we've been doing refueling stations now for about eight years. Uh, we've got over 200 different hydrogen refueling solutions. So that's not hydrogen stations. That could be roll bars, compressors. It could be individual small systems, or it could be one of our big hydrogen refueling stations. So we're focusing heavily now on hydrogen standardization for refueling. Uh, so this is refueling vehicles at 350 bar and at 700 bar, allowing us to get anywhere between 1,000 and 3,000 kilos per day. So pretty big systems, um, shoving a lot of gas into vehicles, but it's incredibly important for us to make sure we're doing that safely and uh, really the most cost-effective way. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions come to mind, and I'll try to ask them one after the other instead of throwing them all at you at once. One question is, of course, the manufacturers of fueling systems, they're working uh, to some extent with existing technology, but you have a group of engineers, they meet together, they get this product from this guy, this product from this guy, and then they set up a team basically to integrate. Uh, do you provide an integrated solution to this refueling station? Because people are getting sick and tired of <laughs> trying to figure out all the differences between this model and this yeah. model when they're all unique. Well, Brian, let's go back to basics. So hydrogen refueling stations are built up of three major components, okay? So you've got hydrogen compression, you've got hydrogen storage, you've got hydrogen dispensing. So at the moment, lots of people out there that are building hydrogen refueling stations get lots of different components and push them together. These are systems that are designed for just the hydrogen molecule, not as a logistic mo uh, molecule, as uh, just a hydrogen molecule, very similar to a helium molecule or something like that. So what happens is you get lots of different companies taking lots of components and pushing them together, and hey presto, you have a hydrogen refueling system. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. You know, a lot of these systems need to be coherent. They have to talk to each other from upstream and downstream, for right from the compressor to the dispenser. So one thing that we do at Haskell is build the whole hydrogen refueling solution. So that's everything from the hydrogen compression, which is at the heart of what we do. Um, 350 bar and 700 bar at a ratio of about six to one compression rate. And then what happens is we take that gas, we store it into intermediate storage. So uh, the engineers who are watching right now will understand how cascade refueling works. We essentially hold gas at much higher pressures than is required. So about 1,000 bar for 700 bar refueling, and then at 500 bar for 350 bar refueling. And the thing that's really important with this is we essentially open the tap. So a really good example of how the system functions on cascade is if you have a, a balloon full of gas and you have a balloon that's deflated, you tie both of those balloons together, suddenly the balloons equalize. And that's all we're replicating, but on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. That With that comes some challenges, of course. So. Well, yeah, let's talk about the challenges, of course, because 
uh, every time I talk to someone who has a background in the physics, the engineering of these systems, I learn something new. This is not your normal gas, is it? It's no. not just any old gas. What is specific about hydrogen? How rare are the characteristics of hydrogen in this universe? Yeah. And what issues do they pose for refueling? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things we have to be very careful about with hydrogen is you know, there's a reason why it's a big scary molecule. And that's because it gives us lots of energy. It's a very, we, we talk about being molecule agnostic. We've got a great molecule that could be the answer to net zero, but of course it's very hard to use. How do we get that molecule into a vehicle safely, first of all, with, with the respect of the temperature um, coefficients? So I'm going to go into a little bit more technical detail very quickly, and it's just to talk about the things you need to consider when you're looking at buying a hydrogen refueling station. So we have lots of people come to us and say, hey, I need to fill a car two to three minutes, or a bus or a truck, seven to 10 minutes. Fantastic, we can do that. But you've got to get that gas nice and cold. And the reason why we do that is the hydrogen molecule acts the opposite of pretty much the rest of the molecules out there. So over the neon and helium, it's to do with the enthalpy, and I'm not going into too much detail around why that works, but essentially what happens is as we dispense the hydrogen molecule, it gets incredibly hot. So it does something called the opposite or the negative Joules-Thomson effect. So what we have to do there is respect that that hydrogen molecule is being dispensed, that temperature is slowly increasing. So then we look at the standards. So there's one standard in particular that lots of people here will know. It's the SAE J2601. An SAE J2601 is the refueling protocol that essentially says how quickly you can fill a vehicle, respecting that upper temperature. So sit with me, we'll get there. So a P max temperature, so we're talking a, a temperature max of 85 degrees centigrade has to be respected. That's our upper limit. Why is that a problem? If I've got a hydrogen refueling station, say over in the UK, in the middle of summer, it might hit 20 degrees centigrade. If then I sell the same system to, the, uh, to Arizona, to the desert, that system will be operating at an ambient temperature of 40 degrees centigrade. Why is that a problem? It's a significant problem because then we have that temperature delta is much smaller. So as that gas is being dispensed, that temperature is rapidly increasing. When I hit my peak of 85 degrees, hey, I've got to stop filling. So that's when we start to cool the gas and bring it down to the minus, uh, minus 20, minus 30, and minus 40. So to enable us to get the molecule into the vehicle safely and to the same as you would at a gasoline station with petrol or diesel tanks, we've got to cool the gas to minus 40. So that's one of the biggest challenges is respecting the temperature of the gas as we start to dispense it. And I find it fascinating that this is related also to the location, of course. <laughs> you don't go to Mars without thinking how hot it is there, right? Or cold, depending on the time of day. Um, what other uh, factors play a role? People used to talk a lot about this notion of, you know, 700 bar tanks or 300 bar tanks. By the way, these conversations were driven by the tank manufacturers <laughs> largely. I've rarely seen a conversation from the perspective of a fueling station yep. which talks, talks about the, the not only the logistics, but also there's a cost factor involved, isn't sure. there? So, um, uh, what is your take on pressurization? Does it also play into this uh, complexity of uh, respecting the environmental conditions? Um, or can there be a level of pre pre uh, pressurization that could be a standard uh -huh. uh, uh, regardless of where you are? Yes, yeah, that's a really great question. So at the end of the day, at the moment, we're working to a 350 bar fill and a 700 bar fill. That's the industry norm. That's what the standards say. That's what the filling tables say. Um, is that the most efficient? Uh, no. You know, 350 is mainly focused at heavy duty uh, logistics, so you can get a lot of gas in there um, without having to do the work to boost it right up to 700 bar. So hydrogen is a very dense molecule, as you'll know. Um, and as you start to push that molecule into a, a pressurized system, you start to hit a peak where actually shoving gas in as hard as you can, pushing that gas into the system becomes less efficient. So it's not saying it's not efficient, but it's not as efficient as it would be um, boosting the gas from, say, 30 bar to 350 bar. You get a pretty linear approach there. As you start to go above that stage, the gas then starts to be essentially become more dense. You're pushing more molecules into more molecules, and in doing so, getting a less efficient fill. So there's swings and roundabouts, as we like to say, some benefits from 700. We're starting to see the logistics fleets and the HGVs, the trains, 
potentially transition into uh, 700 bar. Um, whether that's going to be something that's actually for the longevity of the systems, I'm not too sure at the moment, but we'll see how that goes. At the minute, there's systems out there that are robust for 700 bar and for 350. Um, how does that break down in terms of market applications? That is, who are the consumers who are using the refueling stations and what role do they play? This is obviously not like yeah. uh, a Porsche-like sports car that you're uh -huh. doing because you need volume. So who are you servicing? Um, so right now, Haskell has um, various long-term agreements with various companies. I'll talk about one, which is public information, which is uh, our customers over in New Zealand, Haringa. So Haringa are building a hydrogen refueling network in New Zealand. So essentially, we're focusing our energy at the fleet owners and the operators. Um, slightly controversial, but I don't believe that hydrogen cars will be part of mine and your future. I don't see a hydrogen car part of my drive. Um, and the reason for that is because you need demand. And I'm going to use um, two examples about how we make hydrogen more palatable. So over in the UK, for example, we've closed some stations. You'll have heard Shell, lots of noise about Shell closing hydrogen refueling stations. Um, the reason for that is because they aren't being used. These are big, big stations that cool gas right down to minus 40. And if the systems aren't being utilized, then it's going to be costing you a lot of money. So this is a really good example of you know, what we can learn from that. So then you look at Haringa over in New Zealand. In New Zealand at the moment, they're starting to build this network of hydrogen refueling, and in doing so, it's supporting buses, so vehicles that are back to base. So I keep going on about this back to base concept, but the back to base concept essentially is um, a vehicle that goes from one location to another regularly. So that could be a train, it could be a plane, it could be a truck. And the reason for that is measurable. You know what, the, what it's going to be doing, and you can start to sort of lean off the benefits of the density of the hydrogen molecule. So it's a really big part of what we're doing at Haskell at the minute is ensuring that we're supplying the right people, you know, the right fleets where there is demand, working with the owner operators to help them you know, specify the trucks they might need for the future, um, and really learning from what our customers are telling us. So it's a big thing for us, hydrogen refueling stations, 1,000 kilo minimum per day, 350 and 700 bar. Uh, we almost need, because these are examples, it's so easy to say back to base, but... Um, we need to see this in terms of how many vehicles on a road in a city with a uh, already uh, a large issue of pollution, yeah. uh, fine particle matter, for example. Uh, in Berlin, uh, on certain days, you can complain about the density of fine particle pollution. Yeah. Um, and theoretically, according to European law, they have to shut down the traffic until it gets yeah. better. Yeah. Um, so. Um, we need to look at this back-to-base stuff it, from various perspectives. Could you sort of elaborate on that concept of what vehicles we are potentially talking about? Yeah, for sure. And Brian, I just want to touch on your comment you just made there about air pollution. Um, you know, it's a fact that air pollution is the worst it's ever been. In central London on a summer's day, it's two and a half times the legal limit. And long and short of it is people are dying because air pollution is so high. So we have to do something about it. So just want to make sure that point resonates. Um, but back to your other comments, really the way that we see it is hydrogen trucks and hydrogen buses. That's a real big focus for us at the moment. So working with the likes of Van Hool um, and the truck manufacturers such as Hyzon and Hyundai to support them with refueling is critical. So the biggest ones for us are locations where there is distribution. So the likes of, um, I'm going to use these ex examples, um, Amazon, you know, you've got your large distribution fleets over in the UK, for example, such as, you know, Tesco and Sainsbury's big food, uh, food industry. Um, so anything that's taking a, a product from one location to another that's measurable and can be filled. You're only going to look at what BP are doing at the moment in the UK. They're trying to build a fantastic infrastructure that allows logistics fleets to be filled. So it's a, it's a big part of what we're doing, yeah. I mean, this is really important because delivery vehicles, uh, the people who collect the garbage in cities, they all have these monstrous diesel engines. Mm -hmm. By the way, the really cool thing about the hydrogen garbage collectors is they're quiet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's all sorts of advantages here. Um, I wanted to look at this from an issue of a financial uh, um, equation. Um, of course, uh, we used to talk about this technology as simply clean, and we had great smiles, and we thought, so people buy it. Now it really is an issue of it has to make sense in terms of uh, CapEx. What are your capital expenditures, and what is the revenue flow? Why would you build a fueling station 
if you didn't have a demand? And how, and this is the big question because I think the issue of cars yep. is only put off. Yeah, right? I agree. The issue is not uh, whether cars are going to be battery or hydrogen fuel cell tomorrow or in the next 10 years. It is the logistics, but the logistics because the reward on capital expenditures yeah. is simply phenomenal. It is a win-win. Could you look at it from that perspective? Because you operate fueling stations, and these things need to be financially viable. That's the point. Co completely agree. So first of all, if I was looking at buying hydrogen fleet for my business, right now I'd feel very uncomfortable. If it was a chicken and egg between battery electric vehicle or hydrogen fuel cell, right now the easy option is battery electric vehicle. It's as simple as that. And to say that from someone who manufactures hydrogen refueling, you know, that's where we are at the moment. And the reason for that, and it's really sort of driven by location. So I'm going to use two examples. I'm going to use the UK and I'm going to use California. Two very different places. One place is very hot. One place doesn't want to be part of the EU anymore. <laughs> um, but long story short, what happens over in the, uh, in the UK is we don't currently have um, a system that enables users to want to go to hydrogen. And let me go into that in a bit more detail. So essentially what that means is if you want to build a hydrogen station, what support do you get? Usually very little. And then you need to make sure there's a demand on that system. Currently, there's six or seven hydrogen cars in the UK. We own one of them. You know, so there, there isn't going to be that demand, of course. Yeah. So let's look at California and see how they've done it. So if you buy a hydrogen car in California, you get your fuel paid for for the lifetime that you have that car. You have a credit card, you go to your station, and I can guarantee without fail, if anybody goes over to Long Beach, you will see cars queuing around the block to fill their hydrogen vehicle. Why is that? Because we've made it easy for the end user to make that decision. So the reason why I talk about this is actually our local governments, um, you know, uh, is very critical in supporting the standardization and making it easier for users to want to take on hydrogen. If I'm in California and I can afford the lease in a hydrogen car, about $400 a month, why not? It's an absolute no-brainer. You look at it in the UK, we have the electric car scheme. Thousands of Teslas and really expensive electric vehicles driving around the UK. Um, very new tools in the UK, and why is that? Because we have the electric car scheme. Everything's heavily subsidized. So we need to basically make it easier for us, the end user, to try and take it on board. And that empowering business model is very critical too. So when businesses are making a decision to move away from electric or move away from natural gas and maybe go into hydrogen because we see the potential of this, we just need to make it easier. We try and make things more difficult and the lack of standardization really doesn't help, help us with that. So, you know, a good example would be uh, McDonald's. McDonald's you reuse their cooking oil, you know, and they put that back in the tanks and they run their fleets on cooking oil. The output isn't very nice, but they're still reusing a product that would normally go to waste in landfill. So it's just an example of how actually you can adopt it if you have the demand and you have the local support. Uh, whenever people mention subsidies, there's always a small portion of the population who says, oh, that's where we are. They turn around and walk in the opposite direction. I always feel there's a necessity to, to add uh, that we are still subsidizing the fossil fuel uh, industry massively. They get more than we do, right? It's, it's kind yeah. of a, But there's another interesting factor behind subsidies. Uh, whenever you're changing technology, someone has to get their foot in the door, right? And this applies, by the way, to the electric car. Um, uh, in uh, uh, Oslo, uh, you could buy an electric car and charge it for free because that's the technology. Now, once you get this technology launch, interestingly enough, the subsidies are no longer necessary. So they sort of bow out. What I find interesting in all of these discussions, though, is it is fascinating for me. What is the, what is the win situation when you move from an electric car to a hydrogen car? And by the way, let's replace the word car with vehicle. Yeah. Uh, I love the focus on cars as well, because that's what they're doing in uh, Japan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Japan, Toyota said, you know, we had a partnership with uh, Tesla to develop batteries. Yeah. They backed out in 2015, because that's not the route they're going down. Right. But the big issue for me is, what is the gain of hydrogen versus batteries? There's a very basic physical yep. statement one can make. And? It's, it's a great point. So long story short, less raw material going in. So let's look at the lithium problem. We all know lithium is one of the most challenging 
uh, and probably one of the most controversial elements that we, we get hold of, where we think we get it from is usually not the case. So lithium is a big problem. You know, getting uh, electric cars versus a hydrogen car, much, much different. So you've got the raw resource there. You've got the output at the end. So the batteries, as much as you might argue, in some cases can be renewed and reused over a period of time. They will have a shelf life. Um, a hydrogen car, what comes out at the end? Water. And you can drink that water. The water that comes out is clean. That is the only output of a hydrogen vehicle. So what do we do? We essentially get hydrogen in a tank and we pressurize it. We push it together with oxygen through a, a complex fuel cell process. I'm not going to go into too, too much detail. But in layman's, essentially, we get the molecules to, to push together. In doing so, the output is water. Hydrogen, oxygen, we get water, which is what comes out the back. And that energy we then capture drives the electric motors. So we've got to remember a battery electric vehicle versus a fuel cell electric vehicle are very similar. The only thing you're taking out is the battery. You're using a fuel cell to, to, to create that. So longevity, really, for me, is in hydrogen. Um, the reduction in SOX and NOX is down to zero, you know, out, out of the tailpipe. Um, only driving in today, you will have smelt the diesel molecules in the air. You know, we have to change that, so the output is really critical. But also, fill time. I touched on this at the start, but you can fill a vehicle in the same speed as you would do a petrol or a diesel pump, and your gasoline pump is exactly the same. So you can get gas in there within two to three minutes and have a tank full of gas to drive 400 kilometers. So it's the best like for like you're going to get for diesel and or petrol. Uh, I should add, if anyone has a question from the audience, we do have a few minutes to take questions. So just give me a wave um, if you're interested in posing a question and uh, uh, Jacob will try to address it. We do. Oh, thank you. Vincent Matala from Toyota Motor Europe. You're saying concerning 700 bar heavy duty uh, fueling, uh, we will see how it will go. Yeah. But it takes more than two years to build a station. You still need to develop it while the 700 bar trucks are coming out. Yeah. So which direction are you going to take? Yeah, so all our stations at the moment, we can fill 350 and 700. So long story short, that's what we do. You know, we do that. No, we do 700 bar heavy duty as well. So that's high flow. So if we go into a bit more detail, you obviously know what you're on about. We're talking about 120 grams a second, uh, up to 240 grams per second into the tanks. Okay, but that's at minus 40. So if you look at the refueling protocol, that's getting gas down to T40. So the way we can do that at the minute with our heavy duty vehicles, I'll give you a good example, a 50 kilo tank we've been working on recently at 350 and 700 bar. Okay, so filling a 350 bar versus 700, uh, we do them both. Okay, we've got mock fuel tanks that allow us to do that. Um, the 50 kilo 350, pretty simple. Um, we have to be a bit more clever with the cascade filling, having more high pressure to allow us to get, into, get the gas into the system at 700 bar at the same speed. So yes, yeah, 700 bar is available now, that's what we do. It's just this chicken and egg between do we see um, heavy duty and haulage going to 700 bar or not. You know, it's a very sort of swings and roundabouts approach. The only time I've seen 700 bar currently in, uh, in heavy duty would be on the hybrid style engines. Uh, the hybrid, sorry, not engines, the hybrid style trucks. So Teva, for example, they do a hybrid truck where they utilize 700 bar and uh, a fuel cell battery, essentially a BEV. So doing them both, which allows them that safety if the fuel cell stops or if they run out of gas. So 700 bar is definitely in the mix right now. High capacity is going to be a challenge, like every compressor supplier. You know, we work at a ratio of six to one, and we can do about 960 kilos per day per compressor. So then if you start to look at that from a scalability perspective, you then have four compressors to allow you to get up to your just short of 4,000 kilos. So, so yeah, we do see 700 bar as part of that mix. Right now, we're not seeing that demand, but it's not saying that it won't come. Does that answer your question? It's interesting, uh, 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 just on, uh, related to this question is the issue, um, and the question I was trying to ask is uh, the advantage of the fuel cell car or the fuel cell vehicle, of course, is uh, how many kilometers can you drive? Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, there is an equally negative proposition. Uh, you hear this, you know, 300 bar or 700 bar is also a question of how much energy you want to use in order to compress it that high. Uh, but the batteries are a question of how much weight you want to drag around 
in order to carry the freight with you. And uh, I find this an important issue because uh, the second thing, of course, is how much you're paying for the drivers. If they have to sit and wait for eight to 12 hours or even six hours optimally to charge good. these batteries, yeah, yeah. Um, you have human costs. You have uh, no longer a just-in-time model. You're slowing the process of delivery down. Yeah. Uh, so there's a pile of repercussions there. And our first business model in this industry was largely using hydrogen fuel cells as a backup battery yeah. to recharge a smaller battery within logistics. You, know, you would think, why would you do that? You can just add on batteries. Oh, no, no, no. It's a question of weight. It's a question of you don't have to charge them uh, uh, in, in, in logistics companies, they would have three forklift trucks for every single employee yeah. on a 24-hour cycle. Uh, you know, they could Good operate job. for max yeah. eight hours, then you have to, you know, uh, so you, uh, basically, you, it, it's, that's an expense. That's an expense, and you did not have to do that. And then, of course, how batteries like to be operated. They don't like to be run down to zero. Uh -huh. uh, they don't like to be overcharged. So, temperature uh, as well. Yeah, exactly, temperature as well. So you may get a certain number of kilowatt hours in that battery, but it does not mean that you can optimally use all yep. of that energy repetitively. Sure, right? yeah. So uh, here I am, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, sorry but you, know, you make a really good point, and I think the message really is hydrogen isn't going to be the only answer. And I'm, I'm a really big advocate for this. I'm not going to stand here and say hydrogen will be the answer. It will be part of the solution. So what I mean by that is electric has its place. Okay. Nuclear has its place. Hydrogen has its place. Um, you know, I'm going to very blasé talk about this, but you know, when uh, in the UK for the first time actually during COVID, the whole of the UK ran on renewable energy for the first time. Um, and the reason for that is because there was such a demand that they normally turn wind turbines off. I say turn them off, but essentially stop power going to the grid. Why not capture that power in such as hydrogen through electrolysis, turn that molecule into hydrogen, and then store it, and then when there's a demand for electricity, push it back through electrolyzer to create the power. That's essentially the models that we're looking at too. So, you know, material handling is a really good point. Amazon are going that way at the moment. Plug Power are doing some fantastic things on the smaller dispensers and electrolyzers for material handling. So we're seeing lots of bits of industry starting to fit now. And all those volumes create cost benefits, of course, when you get uh, uh, upscale production. Um, uh, we didn't mention, and we, we're, we're going a little over time here, but this is an important topic. Um, the very fact that we have renewable energy uh, does not mean that we're optimizing and expanding uh, its harvesting. Uh, what I mean by that is literally uh, we are shutting down in Germany wind turbines because uh, what do you do with the energy you don't need? Um, they shut down the last uh, uh, atomic plant, by the way, yeah. but that atomic plant was operating at the cost of using renewable energy. Uh -huh. So uh, it depends on the equation within the economy. We know, however, that in Germany, you operate the atomic plant and then, oh, we've got too much energy in the grid, that's a baseline supply, shut it, shut the w wind turbines down. Now here's the, here's the interesting thing, because it is a su supply side issue as well. Yep. Uh, if you want to expand uh, renewable energy, there is a cap on what you can do simply because the physics say it's impossible to build batteries large enough to stow the gigawatts and terawatts that we need uh, to fuel this economy. And I'm talking not simply about the automotive, uh, where you get into heating and things yeah, yeah. like that. It's a yeah, massive definitely. equation. We need to expand dramatically the uh, use of renewable energy and experts tell me, the physicists, there's no way to store that energy except through electrolysis and storing it in the form of hydrogen. So this is where we are right now. Yeah. Right now there is a running debate, you can see it on the daily news, between uh, uh, people who know you have to expand this and then people who are dragging their heels. Yeah. But what it's going towards is a radical increase of the supply of hydrogen and then the question of what do we do with it. Do you see the side effects of this in your business model? Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we see the impacts of of hydrogen being available. That's a, that's a big problem we have at the moment, is getting hold of green hydrogen. The majority of hydrogen at the moment, and I say the majority, is blue, it's uh, gray, it's in some cases brown. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the different colors because we'll have the whole rainbow here, but long story short, there's cracking molecules that isn't a very nice way of doing it. Um, but that's the way we do it at the moment. Um, there is a clever system where you can, for example, steam methane reforming, capture 
um, the, you know, the carbon capture process and essentially make it carbon negative and output negative. Um, but really, one of the biggest issues we find is generation of the molecule just doesn't exist really at the moment. We're seeing more and more electrolysis coming out all over the world. Europe um, specifically, you know, we're seeing localized electrolysis. The message you just said there is the answer to that really is hydrogen. You know, we've got all this fantastic energy around us. Only last week, I was in the Cornish coast on holiday, and I was sat looking at the waves coming in, thinking to myself, look at all that energy that we're just not using. You know, it's there, it's, it's a gift. So now, one of the ways that we can do this is by capturing all that energy, and like you said, instead of turning the wind turbines off, switching that power to electrolysis, cracking the water molecule, storing the hydrogen, and using that for future energy use. So really having a... Uh, an ecosystem of hydrogen where if it's not going into the atmosphere for the water cycle, we're using it for, for energy. And this is so important, as you said, there's uh, there, uh, 1% of today's hydrogen is um, uh, produced through electrolysis That's right, from yeah. renewable energy. It's, a, it's an industrial gas, so it's been around for a long time, has all sorts of applications. So uh, maybe that should not surprise us uh, what does surprise us, if we look carefully, you've been here for a while. Um, I've been here for 20 years, and the presence of the electrolysis industry at this fair was almost non-existent. We did have steam reforming, which is a way of uh, you get natural gas and you yep. separate all of the carbon and you wind up with, with pure natural gas, which you can use for uh, PEM cells. They don't like impurities. They're yep. really fussy eaters, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, but... The bottom line is, if you look at the state of affairs right now, you'll see that the largest presence among the various branches of the hydrogen fuel cell committee here, the largest presence right now is the electrolysis companies. Yeah. They have, right. they have uh, not only recognized the demand, there is a demand yep. uh, to create green hydrogen. Yeah. So it's not where we are right now with this deplorable 1% of um, uh, some colored hydrogen yeah, yeah. that's not yeah. green. Um, it's where we are going. Yep. And the important thing that's driving that, by the way, is literally the recognition that you have to expand renewable energies. And then it's almost the last reflection. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the stuff that we get? Right. Yeah, and you know, Brian, the market's moving so fast. And what I mean by that is I came to the show uh, about three years ago, and it was very sort of refueling station focused, three to four years ago. Um, but we're now starting to see the value of certain subject matter experts. So what I mean by that is you've got some fantastic businesses out there, McPhee, um, you know, you've got uh, Nell that are focusing heavily on el electrolysis. The same with ITM Power biggest electrolysis uh, in the world, yep. you know, um, over in the UK. They see the value added in that. Um, we see the value added in compression in the refueling stations. So over the last three years, the market has changed so dramatically. And what I mean by that is, at this, um, you go back, even five years ago, every year at the same trade shows, we're, we're going to be on the hockey stick curve soon. It's going to take off soon. I think we're past that stage now. Look around you. This is the biggest hydrogen trade show that there is at the moment, really. And look at how much infrastructure there is. We're past that starting stage now, and we're on that rapid growth curve. And how we do that at Haskell is via standardization. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really important part of, of what we're doing, and we're doing that safely in line with all of our competitors and friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great way to wind up the talk here. Let's talk, to, uh, uh, you know, standardization. Uh, why is this important? Uh, the good old days, I mentioned this during the prep talk, uh, we would have this fuel cell operating on hydrogen, so a tiny hydrogen tank and a fuel cell, and uh, uh, we had to fight for ages yeah. to get the permission to get it into the building. There was another direct methanol fuel cell, and people were, you know, oh, but how much CO2 is being, you know, less than someone breathing was the, but it, it, it's an equation. By the way, in California, if you want to set up a fueling station, you have to go to the local fire department, yeah, yeah, you right? Do, yeah. You can't simply, there's no board <laughs> that certifies these things. So opening up a fuel station means, oh, it's Joe so-and-so in this local town, and he just don't like these newfangled technologies. There, there's mm -hmm. so many different responses that you could get. Um, and this is why standardization alleviates the process. So where are we there? Um, so first of all, standardization helps everybody. Um, before my time at Haskell, I used to work in hydrogen storage. So supplying type one vessels. You know, one of the biggest things we had was there was no standard. There was no standard demand from the market. 
So that's one of the areas, supply chain. It helps the supply chain actually create products that can then have economy of scale, and then we can get the cost down of stations, which then impacts the cost per kilogram of the molecule. For us at Haskell, we've now got three systems. A bit of a sales pitch very quickly. It's the Nano, the Nano Pro, and the Geno, which is fully configurable of modules. So what happens is you say, I need this much compression, this much storage, this much dispensing, and quickly you can get, build a station pretty rapidly. Um, and we're building our standard modules to essentially say, uh, reduce our lead time. Lead time for hydrogen refueling stations at the moment, you'd be very lucky if you get anything less than a year for a refueling station. We can build a, a station in eight weeks if we have all the gear. So if we have all the products in our facility, we can build a station in eight weeks. A nozzle can take us 42 weeks to get hold of. So realistically, it's just the supply chain that needs that support with the standardization. So various different ways. We're in a good place at the moment at Haskell and Ingersoll Rand. Um, we've now standardized our systems. You know, we're over there, come and talk to us about hydrogen refueling stations, and we're happy to help. This is a sad uh, truth of the industry, though, isn't it? It's like, usually, uh, there were uh, public officials who created the standards. And here, this is industry driven. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, no one's knocking on your door saying we have the standard, here it is. Yep. Yeah. All right. Go, go, go back five years, you'd blame the tier ones. You'd be saying, you yeah. know, give me some cars, give me some trucks. Toyota responded to that. They gave us cars. Hyundai are giving us trucks. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to look at it the other way now. We need to give us stations to fill them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we've solved, unless there's any questions from the audience, I think we've solved the major uh, um, issues. Uh, you should keep this conversation going with uh, Jacob Martin, who is at booth E07. It's over there, am I right? Straight over there, straight over there. Yeah, okay, straight over there, E07. Um, uh, and uh, uh, because it is so vital, it, certainly uh, is, yeah. it is always, people use this chicken and egg metaphor, which I hate, but largely, <laughs> uh, you have to have places you can go. Yeah. Um, and we need to get this off the ground. Fueling stations are vital to the whole development. So we're all, uh, we owe you a of, uh, debt of gratitude, uh, uh, Jacob. Yeah, thank you very much. I've been talking to Jacob Martin, who is uh, the Hydrogen Business Development Manager at Haskell. Um, I hope to see you back here next year, Jacob. You certainly will. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, bye now. And thank you. Uh, don't forget that we're still serving drinks. They're on the house here, and our conversation will continue. Allerdings, das nächste wird auf Deutsch sein. Also sage ich das an auf Deutsch. Uh, es kommt eine Pressekonferenz mit meinem Kollegen Uli Walter. Uh, und es geht um grünen Wasserstoff, Erzeugung und Transport. Also im Prinzip im Detail genau das, was wir gerade gesprochen haben auf Englisch. Um, aber das ist eine Pressekonferenz und es dauert eine Stunde. Ja, also intensive Information. Ja, äh, bleiben Sie da, bleiben Sie auf dem Fang. <lacht>